Okay, hi. Welcome to another tech session of network session. So here at Core Code, we have amazing network sessions. Today we'll be having Jared from SpaceX. So I'm going to introduce myself and then I'm going to give all the time to Jared. Um, my name is Joseph and I am tech lead at Core Code. And um, I will present in Jared, which is a software developer in a software engineer at SpaceX. Okay, Yuri. Hey everyone. Uh, my name is Jared. Nice to meet you. And today I'm going to be talking a little bit about picking design patterns and software principles that allow you to create extensible architectures and extensible softwares from the start. And uh, yeah, first I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, so my name is Jared. I work on Starlink at SpaceX, which is a global internet satellite constellation. And I've worked there for a few years now. Before that, I did a few other software projects and also was spent some time in Guatemala looking at uh, internet connectivity around the country, which is pretty cool. Um, and what I work on specifically is I work on the topology that connects satellites that have uh, free space fiber optics or like free space optics on them, basically like space lasers between satellites to determine what architecture we will use when, um, when interconnecting satellites on orbit and uh, use this to provide internet to people around the globe. To be clear today, I am here personally, it, not in a capacity that has to do with my job at all, but those are the types of problems that I work on and the perspective that I'm coming from. Okay, cool. great, great. Thank you, Jared. Okay, um, the time is yours. Um, let's go. Cool, okay. Well, I, I want this to be a little bit more of a conversation. So especially, Yosef, please jump in with questions and uh, any comments if you wanna talk about anything. And if people have questions, I think you can write in the chat. So please feel free to do that and uh, we can walk through it. Okay. So let's go to first slide. Just a few materials here just to sort of back up as we talk. But basically when we think about designing a system, the way I like to think about it is sort of in this this like cute picture up in the top right. Essentially, we, we know where we are and we generally have some idea of what success looks like. Like if we want to, we'll use an example throughout, throughout the discussion. Let's say we wanna build a platform that allows us to stream music. We generally don't know what the architecture is going to look like. We don't know if you're going to have playlists or your songs are going to be collected chronologically or, or right, you, you have a lot of unknowns there, but you have some direction in which you are very likely going to find success. Like starting by, I don't know, breeding horses or something is probably not here in this cloud. And so when, when you have some idea of what success looks like, it is immensely helpful because it allows you to say, what I want to do is find solutions that get me towards success, even if I don't know exactly where success needs to be. And in a lot of the problems that I've worked on, this pretty closely depicts the way or the shape that they tend to take. So when you are starting from this early state, what you want to do is, first of all, recognize that you are in early system phase. And so you want to take a different approach than you would in a mid system phase, which we'll talk about a little bit later. I don't know much about late system phase, and that sounds easy. So we're going to skip that one. And so essentially what you're saying is we want to learn very quickly. Um, something that Yosef reminded me of earlier. We want to make mistakes fast and we want to push out complexity as aggressively as possible. And so some of the principles that I like to think about when you're in this early system phase, part of a project is, first of all, you want it to be so simple 
that it seems stupid. <laughs> like, really, if you are not immediately going to use a feature or a, an abstraction layer or a level of complexity, and it actually takes real work to, to add that complexity to your software or to your architecture, I would totally skip it. Like, in general, you want to make the assumption that you are going to build a system twice. And your first run is get a product as quickly as possible because there is no analysis or brainstorming or thinking that even comes close to actually operating the system, to trying to get someone to actually give you a dollar, to having real load from consumers on your product. There's this saying that people like, or like this trope where you really are, it is impossible for you to predict how a user is going to use your product. They have all these like memes where people will take rakes or something and lick them. <laughs> Users will just find a way to break something that you build in such an incredibly creative fashion <laughs> that trying to figure out how to add extra complexity to prevent this is almost always the wrong way to do it. And so one thing that I really like, you want to do this so aggressively and even more aggressively than that. I'm going to keep it so stupid simple as long as you can achieve your actual milestone. So when it comes to milestones, I think that this is actually something that when it, in, in technical projects, you really underestimate. Because people will say, okay, here's the feature that I want to build. Then what do I build next? Here's this feature. But in my experience, this is generally not the right way to approach the problem. What you want to do is, or how I like to do this, is set an extremely clear, usually functional milestone that says, I want to be able to drag a song, or actually, let's take the, the, the song player example once again. I want to be able to play a song, <laughs> like click on a song and play it. Probably not even click on it. Just open up the app and play a song. This is like a very, very clear milestone and you should be able to, depending on how you're building it, do this within days or weeks. Monthly milestones are very different things. I'd say you want to construct that roadmap, but that's probably not early system design phase. And it's okay if you get these wrong. I would actually expect that. But again, the idea is you just wanna be moving towards the cloud and you wanna be learning more about what's in the cloud here. So like, just to skip ahead real quick, basically the idea is you go from this phase where you don't know a lot, you're taking your first steps and you have a bunch of different trajectories that you can go in. And most of them are probably going towards success. And then as you get smarter and you take more steps, your trajectories start to pare down and you, your cloud gets smaller as you get closer and closer to something that you think actually looks like success. And so what you want to do is you just want to make sure that your milestones are super clear because that allows you to push off, push off complexity in your early stages. And you can say, I want to drag a song from this area to that area. And then if you have an idea for a way to use a smarter data structure, if you can like to store songs, if you can perform your operation without increasing complexity by introducing that technical, like those technical aspects, you, you basically should always do that. But without a clear milestone, it's hard to check whether or not an additional feature will get you closer to a milestone because it's abstract. So this is something that I find really helpful when it comes to early technical projects, especially because then you're not keeping it all in your head and it allows you to, if somebody else wants to help, a little bit more easily start to delineate work and responsibilities. And one thing that I think is really important when you set these milestones is that first, when you set the milestones and also when you select a technical approach, you want to have a very high threshold for changing it. This is something that allows people to spin in the very early days of a project. As, as I said before, you're going to build this twice. You always wanna make that assumption because then it lowers the stakes on your decisions. 
says like, oh, should I use Python or Rust or JavaScript? It doesn't really matter. Just use something that you're comfortable with that allows you to get to your milestone as fast as possible and expect to build the system a second time when you understand the problem much better. And then you can spend a lot more time doing analysis about what stack is going to be the best one. And like, just to stress the nugget in there, if you're much more comfortable with the technology, unless there is something fundamental about the problem that you are solving that makes it not work, I would use the tech that you know, which is a, a totally fine approach being like, oh, it needs to be typed or you want to be using an object-oriented language or it, all that stuff I think is, is noise, especially in your early system phase. Your later system phase or your medium, like medium stage phase is different. But when you are really just building a system, you just want to set milestones that are very clear and get to them as fast as possible. I'm checking chat to see if there are any questions, but if you have any, please, like, please feel free. Um, okay. So another aspect that I find really helpful when I'm looking at systems like these is to think about the first principles of the problem. You hear this a lot at work and at a few other jobs that I've had, but basically when you're solving a problem, you are implementing a feature and in three weeks or two months, you'll have a new feature that you did not anticipate that usually has to do with something you've learned or a new way you've decided to operate the system or a next feature that you just want to build right, for, for your customers. Let's take the song example once again. Let's say you, okay, now you're able to play a song. Now you want to be able to queue up songs, right? So this is... <laughs> It's kind of a cheating example because it lends itself so easily to a lot of a, a lot of different data structures. But um, but if you, when you are starting in a very very simple fashion, that doesn't mean you have to start in a stupid way, right? So the idea is you want to understand what do you think the problem looks like long term, like what are the core principles of this problem for a song player, for example. Songs are like discrete units of audio, right? So it seems unlikely that you would need to categorize sections of a song. And you, it seems very likely that you would want to group a song, like a, a full audio file together. Right? They, they have keys that are known. They will be grouped in various different ways. It seems like at least one unit of your architecture would definitely be a song, right? And then you'll have likely many to many mappings between songs. Like songs will be in many playlists, playlists will hold many songs, songs can be in potentially many albums. I don't know how that works, maybe like the greatest hits albums. Uh, and so you, you wanna be very flexible around what can happen with those songs. Uh, and, example of a way that would not follow first principles there is to say, okay, I'll take songs and because they're sold in albums, I will organize them all into albums. And then I'll have an album and I'll have songs in it, but songs don't need to be part of albums, right? And so this is an, a way where just because that's what the problem looks like right now, that, that doesn't mean, if you are following first principles design, then it should be something fundamental about the actual topic that you're working on that makes this a good architecture, not just here's how people tend to cut this. Yeah. So I, I find that that is really helpful. So if uh, a question here, like if you have a, sorry, Edgar, what is SLA in, in this context? I don't know what he's referring to <laughs> either. Yeah. So I don't know how, what, what is SLA? I don't know, Edgar, if you can, if you can pause, what, what do you mean for SLA? Oh, 
Um, one thing I want to comment is that I really like the early stage because, oh wait, service level agreement. Huh. That's an interesting question. I can't imagine. Okay, so let's say you have a like 99% reliability requirement for your system and you're worried that a language that isn't typed is going to reduce your reliability because you'll find issues at runtime. Is that sort of what you're talking about? Well, let's say it is. <laughs> um, I, I think, I, I think for this one, I would, I would answer this in two ways. First of all, in your early system design, I would expect that you don't have strict SLAs here. And let's say you are like a part of a company that has already sold a product. Um, so you are, I don't know, some big organization and now you, you want to build a new product and you already have known customers for this and they're going to have like a 99% SLA. In this case, I think that starting with a tech stack that would allow you to make this easier would make sense. Like if you have, if you're building a system that's like safety critical, for example, like, I don't know, a rocket, um, then building with this in mind probably does make sense. And so I would break this, like, I might start actually with like an even earlier MVP system that was like a simulation or something. If you want to break down your key, key technical risks. And if you do that in Python, that's cool. Like that's totally fine, but if you need runtime guarantees or you need to like run on bare metal or something like that, um, then I could imagine starting even with your early system, if you think that it will grow into your long-term system, I could imagine uh, picking your language with that in mind. Makes sense. Joseph, did you have a question or comment? No, I, I was I was gonna say a comment. Um, well, first, this is really interesting because um, yeah, sometimes we have flexibility, and sometimes we need to address some SLAs that they that they say. Uh, but what I want to say was that earlier stage, I like also to think about as divide and conquer, because you have a big idea with a lot of requirements, and you are sometimes you're overwhelmed with all the things that you need to to get. Uh, that I think the wise decision is to separate each of the options that you have and start conquering the issue with little issues, right? So, um, yeah, to start in a simple way to get into the, solve the whole problem. So, yeah, just the only thing yeah. that. And, and when you do that, how do you, how do you think about where to start? Like, how do you really uh, approach that? Well, I usually approach that in the most critical path. So for example, I don't know, the login. Um, authentication will be something critical, right? So I might start developing authentication to have kind of the grasp of the technology that I will be using. And because of authentication involving a lot of technologies that kind of the system will have, like the database, the front end, the back end, it's a good for me. It's a good place to start, right? It's a, it's a good path yeah. that will touch in each of the each, each of the sections or technology that I will be working in, but in a simpler way. So yeah, totally. Yeah, it's like you, you build the skeleton and then you flesh out the skeleton, but you build like the full pipeline from you start your interaction to you accomplish some like very simple ver version of your end business objective. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, correct, correct. Yeah. I think that makes a ton of sense. Hey, and and the nice thing about that is it, it, it kind of fits into like set a set an end milestone that's as simple as possible. But and this is probably a, a nice point of flesh this out, but like explores as much of your of your critical path as you can. That's cool. I like that. Yeah. Um and and, and I think a, another piece of this is if you have any pieces that have a particularly high amount of technical risk, I would attack that first. Sure, sure. And, and, and that's just because like you wanna buy down your technical risk as quickly as possible, especially if you're not sure whether or not something's possible. 
riches. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which those are those are tough problems when it's like that. <laughs> yeah, for <pretty laughs> sure. Um so ah, an, another way to think about like what are the fundamentals that you should keep in mind when you're building your early architecture? Something that I like to think about a lot is like split responsibilities amongst your system and then think about what information each each responsibility holder fundamentally needs. Like sometimes there are ways to hack around things, but they create actually which we have a question on technical debt, which yeah, I'll, I'll get to you right debt. after this. Um, yeah, okay. and, 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 go ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 please. Oh yeah, no, I was just gonna say that sometimes uh, because we don't define responsibilities as you were saying, we just start creating different features and creating features fast makes our project rigid in a way that we cannot be Kind of flexible right and um i think as you said we need to address responsibilities and say okay this will have this and this will have th that and that gives us flexibility it doesn't look like it will give you flexibility but in the future <laughs> it will give you flexibility and and as the president said we will, we will have less technical debt and and i think like gustavo in in answer to your question here, like to, to, to append on to what Yosef is saying. I also think that uh, there is a difference between features that are missing and features that have like kind of been hacked together. Like you have way more technical debt from the latter than you do from the former. Because when you have made your system so dumb simple, yes, you have a lot of missing features but i don't think you have a lot of debt because you haven't had to do things in either the fast way that you knew was stupid today or and and i think people usually don't think of this as technical debt but it totally is a thing that you thought was smart today but you learned more information and realized it actually wasn't smart six <laughs> months from now when you were actually going to need the functionality and so I think that like keeping things really dumb simple is a little bit different. We'll actually end up generating less technical debt than it might seem. And from what I said before, even if you don't actually end up doing this, I think the framework of you're going to build this twice, like expect to build your system a second time allows you to hold less fear of technical debt and optimize for moving quickly. Cool. Um, yes, and, and this last point, just to sort of sum up what, what we were saying before, like you don't think that you know how things are going to work or what you're going to need to do. But what you probably do know or have a good sense of is like what things fundamentally are. Right. And going back to this toy example, you don't know how people are going to want to organize their music, but you know that you, you have a good understanding of like what music is. Right. And so being able to organize things where you say, OK, music, you probably want to use like lightweight IDs for different file formats and then you probably want to hold some like byte array that represents an audio file in some map or database somewhere no matter how you end up cutting it that architecture is probably going to work for almost any way that your music works because it's just it uses like the fundamental principle that is music can be keyed pretty simply and it is, and it represents a discrete chunk of data. Yeah. Does that make sense to you, Yusuf? Yeah, and um, I think the main key is abstraction. Um, going back to the, to, to the your example of music, like for example, certain music, right? 
uh, maybe at first you thought music will only have albums, like you said, like they will be in albums and you will want to sort albums, right? But then you realize as, 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 the, pro as the project progresses, you realize that there are singles <laughs> and you can uh, sort music through singles and albums, right? So because of abstraction, you don't need to change the whole thing, right? You just need to change the sorting phase. And um, so abstraction is a really great tool in early systems and, and even in the whole life of the project, right? Uh, to be yeah. used uh, in order to solve those those issues. Yeah, and, that, and that's an excellent example because it's one that I, I hadn't thought of at all, but because fundamentally like music is a, like each song is a self-contained entity, then that type of sorting falls out naturally because it represents like the fundamental principles or the first principles of the problem. That's like an awesome example. Yeah. And oh, that I feel like you, you read ahead here. And you, <laughs> this is a great segue. Thank you. Uh, and, and a lot of the times that flows from having clear system abstractions. And so if you say, all right, what is my problem? I probably want users to interact in some way and they need to collect their information because they are one entity. And then I want music and these are pretty distinct ideas. So there's probably a good abstraction that I can build there. And I think you want to be thinking about a potential long-term architecture and have one in your head and build towards that you want to build in a way that you are moving towards what you think is a long-term architecture, but in like the simplest possible manner. So something that I think is maybe even maybe too hacky for, for this approach, but let's say you started with a single user and you had songs like under a user's profile. This is definitely the wrong way to architect it, but, but let's say this is the simplest thing in the beginning, even then, within that profile, you still probably want to abstract the songs, even if it just means literally putting the code in a different place, just so it's easy to then pull out and stick somewhere else. And so having clear abstractions in your head, even if they are sort of informally represented in the code, I think is, is still something that's useful. But the ideal situation is like something I will do very often when I'm building something is if I think that this decision if today I'm going to say, what's the rating of a song or something, but I don't want to build the whole rating system yet. So I'll just say, but I'm building something that requires that they're rated. I don't know. Uh, I will write a function that says like get song rating and have it always return the same number. But now I have a function. And when I want to make that feature more complex, I can put all the intelligence in there and everything that's built on top of it will just work. And creating those like dummy abstraction layers can be helpful in sort of outlining the skeleton of your architecture without having to actually introduce complexity. And, and um, I have a name for those functions. Those functions are future me problems. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah. so when I when I start coding, I say, okay. This function will be future me problem. I don't, I don't know what will happen. What will happen is just have the function right there. This is useful. As you said. <laughs> and when you do that, you're being really nice to future you because they don't yeah. have to go back and, and read through all the code that was built in this early system uh, uh, strategy and try to figure out how to how to tear out the business logic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So this is early system. I'm going to touch, we're going to like go to midterm system next, but I want to pause for a second. If there are any questions, take a look at the chat. I don't see any new ones. No, I don't think so. Cool. Okay. Let's do it. Okay. So midterm systems. This is sweet. Congratulations. You've taken a few steps, started here, and now you're like, I don't know, three steps in, and your cloud is much more defined. You're still not sure if success is going to be, can you guys see my cursor? Yeah, okay. You're still not sure if success is going to be here. Oh, 
here or here or there or there. But this cloud is much smaller and it's easier to see where you are, are trying to head. So this is what we were talking about before. It is not crazy to rebuild the system completely at this point. I, I've been on projects multiple times where I wish we had done this because we end up having entire components that we never needed, or you build something for testing early on that you don't end up needing and it requires a lot of, or introduces a lot of edge cases. Like in, in, in Edgar's example, where I think in, in that world, you probably have a more mature product. Like you might be starting with a smaller cloud in a world where you already have a service level agreement in your head. In that situation, you may want to build with the thinking that you might rebuild the system, but you probably wouldn't. But in a world where like our music app, for example, I bet you, you build that twice because you are just so fresh. It, like it, it's such a new problem and you really don't know what it will end up looking like. I think you probably would, would actually build it, see if you can get people to use it or whatever your goal is. And then if you want to go from a small to a, a medium sized system, you, you, you might just rebuild it. And, and then, uh, oh. and then this is the point in a project where I think you start to think about larger long-term technical bets. Like, do you want to build a whole module to analyze to run like statistical analyses on the way that people are using their music or listening to music, to music, listening to music. <laughs> uh, th this is not something that I would probably do just yet, but like having one person work on it or starting to think about where it might fit could, could start to make some sense it, at this stage of a project. Yes, have you got anything, have any thoughts on, on these two before I move on? Um, yeah, I, I'm just gonna say that sometimes it doesn't look like this, but we're building the system is cheaper and easier for for the project itself. Um, so yeah, I, I think we don't need to be scared or of rebuilding things. Uh, I think it's a good thing, it's a good thing. Uh, so yeah, in uh, regarding the long-term technical depths, at the mid-term system point, I think you have kind of more experience on what truly the issue is or the problem that you are solving is. So you have a better overview on what you are considering as a technical depth. But yeah, yeah. Totally agree. And also, if you go, if you go back here, you would be able to set much clearer milestones and potentially replicate the functionality that you actually need much faster than you think. If you like really think about what does your system fundamentally need to do and what were all the things that we thought we needed to do that we actually don't. Okay. These are two areas that I think I consistently underestimate whenever I'm building anything are testing and observability. So when, when you want to build something, <laughs> you very likely want it to work. And if you want something to work, it means that you, and you want it to always work and you want it to work when something over here, and you want like a piece over here to continue to work when something over here changes, you, you basically just need to test your software. You need to implement regression testing. You need to have unit tests. It's just the only way that I know of to like reliably build software that doesn't break. Um, and a lot of the times I've seen people think of testing as like sort of second class, like you build your feature and then you write some tests. And I, I'm not a huge, I'm not like a, an enormous advocate for test-driven development, like writing your tests first. It's not crazy, but, um, but I will definitely think about whether or not I can test or how I would test something as I'm designing it. One way that I like to do this is I will construct functions such that you 
you have a test that explores every logical branch where the function can split. And just because of like the way that permutations work, this gets super painful to do if I have very big functions. And so it, it pushes me to write more modular code. This is something that I found to be pretty useful. Um, and you should just be structuring your code in a way that like this just makes it easy to verify functionality. And I'm just gonna add that I have found myself in those situations when I start testing and and, and then that this goes out it goes long because different sections. So I, I start thinking to myself, okay, maybe I need to create a model for this and, and maybe I need to separate the responsibility of this function, right? So yeah, when you're testing that, uh, you then suddenly realize that you need to create separate entities for separate responsibilities. So, yeah. <laughs> totally. Yeah. I find this all the time when I'm like, oh, I have to build, I have to like construct some totally unrelated object just to check this functionality. There's probably something wrong with the way I structured my code. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I actually think that, that that's pegged to this. Like when you don't have abstractions that, that present like the fundamental principles of your underlying problem, you very like, like you very often end up having to like build a whole person's profile just to check that their email is validated correctly, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then system observability, I think is sort of a similar vein. Like, at, at work, we have a really interesting problem about this because we run a real time system. And so we care a lot about being able to check what it is doing. But anytime you're gonna have a system that has real users, oh, sorry, I have this light, okay. <laughs> Um, anytime you are going to care about a system working, you need to be able to observe what is happening to it. And this can be how users are interacting with it. So the analytics that are baked into your application, or it can be what is causing you to fail. So log messages for a system that's like running in the cloud or running in the prod. Observability of a system is super important, both because one, it is the only way to make sure that a system stays safe and you understand what's happening. Two, it's really, really difficult to make business decisions if you do not have observability of how your system is being used. Like, what do you build next if you don't know how what features that you've built currently are actually in use? I would say observability when you start to think about, okay, we're in the midterm, we are having real users, we really need to care about like this being robust. Uh, you you want to start immediately thinking about observability telemetry analytics. Oh, nice. And, and I think that's something that came up a lot of times because you're using a real time system, right? Um, and sometimes yeah. I think- Yeah, totally. Yeah, and sometimes I think our observability, um, it can only be catched when it's running, kind of in production, and when it's using by real users, right? Um, yeah. So I think it's really important to have analytics in order to kind of try to guess, well, not guess, but <laughs> to identify what's the, the reason or, or the behavior of the system itself to see, yeah. okay, maybe this feature is needed and we don't really even know. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I think guess is a little bit, I think you're pretty <laughs> right there, <laughs> but you want to make an informed guess, not just a blind one. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and that's how you do it. Yeah. I agree. Okay. Two questions from Madeline. Do you document your test ideas or, or do you just keep them in your mind? Um, so oftentimes I will think about, when I'm thinking about tests, I will say, I've, I basically want to write regression tests that will run against my code to make sure that my, like my code functionality it is maintained. And so sometimes while I'm writing code, I'll write down, oh, this could break in this really nasty, subtle way that would really screw me up. And then I'll go and I'll write a test that checks it. Sometimes what you can also do is write tests along the way. 
I hate doing this because I'm lazy, but it is like definitely the right thing to do <laughs> because once you write five functions and they all play together and then one of them has a bug, what I will do, find myself frequently doing is I have to trace through all five of them to find the bug. Where if I wrote a function and then wrote a test and then wrote a function and then wrote the test, I'd be able to, like, it, it creates A, a much steadier timeline for software because you're less likely to find nasty stuff at the end. And also, I, I bet you it cuts down your debug time. I do this sometimes, but not all. So I would document it, but ideally, you document it with code. Also, I'm looking to the side because that's where my second screen is. <laughs> um, I think there's another question. Um, how much documentation is needed in this space, or the code should be enough? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, this is, I think, a function of a lot of different things. One is how many people are working on the system. You still want to write docs, honestly, even if you're the only one. But you need fewer or more if you uh, have more people working on it. The other, but, but like what forms should docs take? I would really, like we mentioned at the beginning, try to focus on truly moving as quickly as possible. I think in most of the cases, that means probably writing documentation in line, like writing comments, maybe writing a readme, but probably not writing like a like an RTM, like a manual page or something like that. Like I, I would try to do the minimum that you need to in order to understand what the functionality is at a high level. A few ways that, like I think that Generally, what that means is a high level line explaining functionality for each block of code, for each function, and super clear variable names. Um, I had some like, like little notes. Um, oh, dang. Let me see. Yeah. For the end, but like one of them is like comments are good, but code is really king. Hey, code doesn't doesn't go out of sync because it is the thing executing the logic. And one thing to remember is the fact that code is for humans. Like code ideally is your documentation because the machine does not care about your code at all. Right? It takes that and turns it into something it can understand. The only reason that we use like some legible series of characters when we try to implement logic on machines is so other humans and us later on can go and understand it in the future. And so if you're writing code that isn't legible, like who are you writing it for? The machine doesn't care, you know? Um, and so ideally that's where your docs are. Correct. And um, just, commenting on the on the comment stuff. Um, I found myself in a, in a project that we were, that we have documentation, right? But we, well, the break grew up fast. So the documentation was not being addressed. So we were telling everyone that the real truth of the project stays at the code. <laughs> so if you wanna know, the truth, look at the code. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And <laughs> yeah, sometimes also because of an agile environment, people tend to make the mistake that documentation doesn't even, um, it, it doesn't, isn't important, right? But documentation is important. And as you say, documentation is important, but the code is the truth. <laughs> um, it needs to be readable. And, and in a like a pull request, if someone's like, yeah, this is cool, but it took me 10 minutes to understand what this was doing, that I, that's a totally legit comment. Be like, yo, make it clear. Like, I don't understand it. Correct, correct. 
Okay. Let's see. Maybe it wasn't that. Cool. And here's like it's just a, a, a view of like some tech that I, I think that a lot of the times observability in systems is e easier than people think. Like sending back a, a, a dashboarding system or like a, a stack for observability that I, I'm a fan of is um like publishing things to Kafka topics and then sending that to Prometheus and then visualizing that in Grafana is like a pretty common like real time telemetry monitoring system that I've seen people use. And like it, I think it's pretty sweet, can handle a bunch of data. Cool. Um, all right, here's some like last lesson, stuff like that. So for system state, uh, I think that like state is the kind of thing that very commonly screws you where you end up so for testing i find i find state to be really difficult for testing like i don't know what you think yosef but i feel like anytime you need to create state and it's a lot to recreate it makes testing a huge pain for me correct yeah i agree <laughs> <laughs> and, and so i would i would handle this with care like data stores are patterns that people will often use to ensure that state doesn't screw them quite as much um, because it's really simple and you don't have a lot of functionality mixed in with your state. Um, ideally, you have business logic and state separated so that your functions, and this is like sort of more functional coding or, or like a functional paradigm, but um, when you can separate that out, it makes it simpler to test underlying functionality because you don't need to recreate some internal state. Um, yeah, which can be difficult. Another one, this is a mistake I see people make all the time when something is slow in their code and they're like, I know what's slow. It must be this. You like, you don't know what's slow. Like <laughs> you almost never know what's slow, even when it's super obvious you could totally be wrong. I've seen this happen a ton of times and it is really easy to profile your code. It's like there are a ton of libraries for profiling code. You, you want to profile your code, check what percentage of time you're spending in each function and then that's how you should decide to optimize. Uh, yeah, where to optimize your code. Like it is, I like was joking with my team at work about getting t-shirts made that says, <laughs> Oh my gosh. Oh no, I did this wrong. This is terrible. Okay, I'm sorry. It's literally the opposite. This is the worst thing I've ever seen. Profile before you optimize. My gosh. Oh, I almost ruined everyone's life. This. <laughs> now, now listen to it. Don't listen to me before. Profile before you optimize. It absolutely what you have to do. Like you need to be profiling your code if you think something is slow. Um, this we really went over. Uh, readability over elegance. Sometimes people will think it's like super freaking slick to put something in a single line, but it takes somebody five minutes to read it. I would, I would like push back against this. I, I have the same impulse because sometimes, at least I find for computer scientists, like it's cool to like make it super slick and simple. I think simplicity means readability, not lines of code. And, and uh, just adding to that, um, yeah. the time for another developer to understand elegance, it's budget on the project, right? So um, that's another point for readability. So it needs totally. to be clean in order to everyone to understand it. Cool. Agree a hundred percent. I mean, your code is going to be read read like a hundred times. You're going to write it once. <laughs> the effort of saving one line when you write it compared to everyone else taking <laughs> it, it, like compared to hours of extra effort in aggregate for your overall project, just like they do not compare. Correct. Okay. <laughs> mm, okay. Let's 
Gustavo has a question about branching. Okay, yes, if you want to take this one and then I'll add on. Um, yeah, I mean, it says, in your experience, how many branches did you recommend for any project that stage in QA? And how many approved your, how many much proofs your PRs may need in order to be considered? Well, in my experience, um, I might have kind of three different branches, like the main, the QA, and for the PRs, I would say the people that have the more technical knowledge should be the ones making the, 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 the visibility of the PRs, right? So um, I would say the good, a good amount of people will, will be at last two because you can, you can have two different uh, perspective for the, for the, for the uh, code that you're submitting. Um, that's from my experience. I don't know what you think, Jared. Yeah, I, I, I think PRs are a really unique opportunity to, you, you absolutely very much agree. You want somebody with experience that understands the code base, especially when it's something that might be a little bit sensitive. Um, but PRs are a really good opportunity to, to imbue culture and to spread knowledge or awareness. Like something that I think is kind of cool to do is you have one reviewer who's an expert and you have one reviewer who you want to learn more about that system. Like sometimes it's a reviewer that's totally unrelated or a new person that's just ramping up because it, PRs allow you to both, it, they force somebody to read the code and understand it they force you all to have conversations about the code and trade specific decisions that are made. And they give you the opportunity, especially if you are more experienced and you're reviewing somebody else's code to enforce like d design principles that your organization has. And when you get a, a comment on a PR and it forces you to change something like two or three times, it very quickly changes your coding habits. So, so I, I would say like th that's how I would think about PRs, and and I agree with what you are saying. Like you definitely want like two people work, and definitely at least one of them you you want to have like a technical expert on there. Um, and in terms of the branching, yeah, I agree. I think that that approach basically like works. Uh, the way I would, hmm, yeah, no, I have nothing to add there. The one thing that I would be really cautious of, sometimes I've seen people hold um, feature branches around for a long time, and then they will like rebase because they want to pull this one feature in to do something, and then it just sits and decays on the side. I would I would avoid this. Like I think if it's not in master and it's not does not have a regression test it might as well not exist because within a few weeks, it's going to break. Correct, correct. And, and Jared, uh, regarding the PR, that's something really great. Um, I, I, that's also something that has been pushed at, at work, at the work that I'm currently working in. And the, the less experienced people doesn't have the permissions to merge, but they, they, they are kind of the flow so they, they know what is happening. They can have conversations of the, in the PR and they know what's happening in the code. I mean, they don't have yeah. permissions to merge, but they are there. So yeah, yeah. point. That's awesome. That's, I mean, that's like a great way to do it. And, and it's, it's exactly what we're saying. Like you, you need a technical person, but you want to have people that are less experienced also be on there. That's cool. Correct. And then last point here is, and I really touched on it before, but like, like this isn't like a fluffy point. Literally the reason code uses words is because it is for humans to use. <laughs> like machines do not care about words, right? <laughs> and so, and, and so I think that this is something that's easy to forget because code is like, a lot of the times people will paint coding as something that's like super technical and in the weeds, and, but the code is fundamentally a communication of logic, right? That, 
It is a representation of logic. And it is just a very specific way to explain something to somebody. And if I tell a story and no one knows that no one understands what happened, it's not their fault, it's mine, right? And, and I think you, you think of, you should think of code the same way. Like if something is not readable, it it's not good code. Even if like the story actually happened or you explained all the events or it technically executes the logic. Um, I'd say that like that, that shouldn't be your success criteria. Yeah, I agree, I agree. <laughs> Um, that's all I had. Uh, got five minutes left. Are there okay. any other questions? Or are you, yes, if you want to discuss I, anything else? I do have two questions. Um, right. but I don't know if someone else has, has another questions on the chat. So I don't know if you, oh yeah, I think we have covered all, all the questions. Yeah, yeah, well. Okay, well, while waiting, if, if someone has uh, another question, you can post it can, on, on the chat. But my first question will be, uh, and this is kind of a recommendation. So I don't know if you can recommend to us a movie, a book, or a podcast that you like, and why? <laughs> there, there's a YouTube channel called Computer File that I really like. And they, <laughs> oh yeah, oh cool. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> I, I think they do an incredible job of explaining really interesting technical problems and like in a very clear way. What do you think? Yeah, and, and they're super simple because can, it's, it's kind of an interview, right? So they are yeah. just recording and they get someone there and, and there are even videos that they, Kind of explain a paper so so they were so, so they start drawing on the paper and say hey this this is like this and in, in, in a simple way so yeah i yeah. like it i love that the, the channel. yeah and and they like one thing i really like about it also they they go into real technical depth like they actually talk about the real technicalities where a lot of the times i find that videos are either one hour and it's just a professor or they're like three minutes in the cartoon, it doesn't actually go deep enough. So I, re I really like that, that channel. I'm a big fan. Yeah, nice, nice one. <laughs> um, okay, um, next one. Um, what would be your last message if kind of tomorrow the internet disappears? Um, oh no. <laughs> the Starlink goes down. <laughs> They call you and say, hey, the systems are down and everything goes <laughs> on fire. Uh, what, would you, what would be your last message for us? <laughs> this is a good question. I think that there's something uniquely special and human about building things, like creating things and seeing something that you built come to life feels like unlike anything else. And I think it is pretty universal and really unique. And remembering that, like remembering that at the end of the day, if you made something and you came home and like feeling that pride, I think is something that is really important to appreciate as you go off and you build more stuff, even when it's small, even if you think it's simple, like, just the act of creating something is really unique. Something I like to remember, and I feel like it's, that'd be my last message. 
Nice, nice. I, I really like that message because because uh, the feeling of building something from from ground in in that, that being yours kind of was the main thought that um, makes me want it to become a software developer. So the oh, idea of building. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> I, love I will that. love your I will love your message. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, um, well, great. Uh, awesome. It was awesome. I really did like it. And um, thanks for coming. Um, you are welcome anytime here. So thank you. Thank you, Jared. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, everyone, for coming. It was really uh, great to spend some time with you. Okay, great. See you, everyone. Thank you.